Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second session of uh, today's Sonar Plus D. Um, next up is Zach Lieberman, who is a, um, a educator and a, a programmer, and he's going to be talking about poetic computation. Hey. So I'm super excited and honored to be here. The first thing I'm going to do is ask you to stand up. So I want you to put your right hand in the air. And then I want you to put it on the shoulder of somebody that you don't know. <laughs> and now I want you to put your left hand in the air. And I want you to put it on the shoulder of somebody else that you don't know. And now, and this looks awesome, I'm going to take a picture. <laughs> now what I want you to do is qu really quickly introduce yourselves and then make a new friend. <laughs> and then when you're ready, have a seat. Um, I'm, I'm so excited. I, am always, I always try to do that because I think it's really, it's really beautiful that we're all here together. So I'm, I just want um, you all to meet each other and to make lots of new friends, and I'm excited to meet all of you. Um, quick introduction to myself. So my name is Zach Lieberman. I'll talk to you today about poetic computation. I used to look like this. I studied fine arts, painting, and printmaking, and I spent all of my time in the printmaking studio and what happened is that I had to get a job. And at that time, everybody was doing web design. This was web 1.0, like Y2K era. And I, got a, I totally lied. I got a job doing web design. And at that moment, I discovered something kind of amazing, which is that you could write a line of code to make something move. And I had always loved animation. And I never knew how to do it. You, at that time, I think you would really have to go to film school and, but I discovered that you could code to make something move, and I got really excited about that, and I'm quite passionate about animation. I do all kinds of projects. I'm going to kind of talk about some re recent stuff, but just to kind of um, explain where I come from, this is a project that I really love called the iWriter that I helped with, where a group of us worked with a um, paralyzed graffiti writer named Tempt, and we built a, an open source eye tracking um, hardware and software system that tracks his eye movement. So he's a graffiti writer who's completely paralyzed, and we built a tool that allows him to draw graffiti with his eye movements. This is a project that I did with Toyota, where we took a small car, the smart car, and people think that you can't drive them quickly, um, and we uh, hired a stunt driver to drive letters of the alphabet. So we made a font completely out of driving. This is a project that we did in New Zealand. This is a building projection. And most building projection projects involve the building kind of falling apart and coming back together. And we did something that used your body. So when you come, you would see yourself as a kind of giant monster five stories high. I've been doing this kind of media art for a long time. I taught at a school called Parsons for about 10 years. And five years ago, some friends of I and I decided to start our own school. And we started the school called the School for Poetic Computation. We are based in New York, and we run an experimental program. It's basically a 10-week program where people come from all over the world to learn about code, electronics, and theory. We're really excited about the notion of celebrating poetry. So most people, when you describe the work that we do, they, they talk about this term creative coding or creative coder. And to me, that term feels always quite strange. Like, um, the word creative feels strange. Uh, you know, you have these concepts of like creative city or creative industry, and it feels kind of pejorative. Like, are there other types of programming which are not creative? And also, we really wanted to celebrate poetry. Like, most, you know, I don't know, that we really wanted to kind of make the poetic the kind of centerpiece of what you're doing. And in the tech world, there's this concept of demo, like demo or die. And the word demo really easily can be turned into the word poem. And we really want to be making poems with the work that we do. 
Poetry is amazing because you have to go to the back of the bookstore. So when you go to a bookstore, it's always this tiny section in the back. You know, nobody's getting rich writing poems, but poetry is this very beautiful kind of celebration of what it means to be human and what it means to be alive. And that's what we try to pro prioritize at the school. So we run this program in, in New York. Um, and we do electronics, we start actually from the ground up. So we, um, students learn how to make circuits, and from the circuits they learn how to make logic, and from the logic make computa computation. And we cook a lot, we do a lot of kind of cooking and eating um, in the school. I always thought graduate school would involve a lot of drinking wine and arguing, and it was never like that when I went to graduate school for my MFA, but at our school we drink a lot of wine. And um, one, I teach a class called Recreating the Past, and this class is really inspired by this book. This book I love, it's called um, The Art of Computer Designing. So I'm gonna show you this um, PDF really quickly. I'm gonna find it. Art of Computer Designing. So I found this, this book, it's kind of amazing. It's from, from the mid-90s um, by Osamu Sato. So the thing about this book, like first I really loved it because it had this beautiful graphical language, um, and it's all about how to use the computer to make art, kind of like how you can kind of use graphics um, to make interesting forms. Like I just, I, I don't know, I fell in love with like kind of how this book looks. Um, but at the end, there's this amazing part of the book. He has this afterword, and he says, you know. Um, I would like, he's thanking people, he's thanking all the people that made the book possible, and he said, I would like to um, acknowledge my favorites, the Russia avant-garde, Futurism, and Bauhaus, whose brilliant typefaces and designs have in, it, in many ways shaped my own mind. If the artists of those movements were alive today were to work with computers, I am certain that they would discover new artistic possibilities. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. And this sentence, I love this sentence so much. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. I, I love this sentence because it really suggests kind of what, you know, how to teach. It suggests a way to teach. And what I do in this class, I have this class called Recreating the Past where every week we look at a different designer or a different artist. And then the student's job is to recreate their work. So for example, Muro Cooper, who helped create the MIT Media Lab, she had a group there called the Visual Language Workshop. She was really kind of focused on the intersection of computation and typography, these early days of working with computers and typography, um, thinking about what, how you could have type in 3D and use transparency. And so the students will look at her work and then have to recreate one of her projects using modern tools. Or the artist Vera Molnar. Vera Molnar is a Hungarian artist who lives in Paris. And since the 70s, she was writing software to control a pen plotter to make algorithmic drawings. And the students would look at her work and study her work and then try to recreate it using modern tools. And we designed an installation for the school where we want to show what the school is doing. And in this installation, we want to show the code and the visual side by side. So most people, when they see artwork that's created by software, you don't see the underlying code. You know, you just see the output. But we really wanted to show the, the code and the visuals kind of as equals, really right next to each other. So we designed this installation. Um, called Recoded, and we actually set it up here last year at um, so Sonar Plus D, so I'm super excited to be back. And the idea behind this installation is that there were two screens, and when some line of code on the left side would change, the, you would see a corresponding change in the visuals. Here we are, this is at Sonar last year.
so here you can kind of see what it looks like. When something would change on the right side, you would see a corresponding change on the left side. Um, and I love this project. It was like a film festival for code and, uh, and really made code visible for people. Um, and my students made so many sketches. For this project, they probably made 50 or 60 sketches. And I got so excited watching them sketch that I got really inspired myself. I'm going to walk you through my process, which um, about two and a half years ago, I started this process of doing daily sketches. And I'll talk about how that works and really inspired by my students. I'm going to start with one kind of like investigation, then I'll talk about the sketches generally. Um, so one of my students at the school, Yuki Yoshida, he, for his final project, he created a book where he wanted to show there's many different ways to th tell the computer to draw a circle. If you were to tell the computer to draw a circle on the screen, there's actually lots of different algorithms or approaches that you could use to draw a circle. And he created a booklet where he collected these, and he sort of showed the code and the visuals side by side, much like that project I just showed you. And I thought about an idea for him, and I wrote him an email, and then I coded it to show him. And the way this works is you start with a rectangle. And you pick a point on one of the sides, just a random point. And then you take a random point on one of the three other sides, and you draw a line. And if that line intersects the circle, you don't draw it. But if it misses the circle, you draw it. So all of these lines are lines that don't hit the circle. They're just missing the circle. So in a way, it's kind of drawing by absence. By using lines like drawing everything that's not a circle, you can actually see a circle. And I got so excited about this idea, so I coded this sketch for him. And then I just started experimenting. So I tried words. I tried the word love. That didn't work very well. I tried a smiley face. That also didn't work very well. But then I was thinking, what if those lines actually bounced? What if they could get in the letters and actually kind of bounce around? So I started to experiment with, with coding um, reflection, so how these lines could actually reflect or bounce off the letter forms, and experimented with reflection um, and refraction. What if the lines could bend when they hit the letter? And I created an installation for people to come and try this. Um, and the way this installation works is there's a light table, and when you put down shapes that we've laser cut, you can see what it would look like with the software simulates light bouncing off of these shapes. And what, what I love about a project like this is that it's very physical. You come to it, and you can interact with it quite quickly. You see yourself. You see your body. And there's something like, and by the end, people were not even like, they stopped even using the shapes. They were just using their hands or like put their head down. And there's something quite physical. It's a project that starts with your body. But it, I can really, when I watch people interact with it, I can see it go from their body to their mind and then back to their body. In this pathway of sort of mind, body, mind, or sorry, body, mind, body, I find quite beautiful. Like you can watch it happen. It starts with the body. You can see yourself, but then it kind of, you start to figure out how the system works and, and interact with it. And it's quite, quite beautiful to see how people um, can engage. And in a way, this is people engaging with my sketchbook. I started this process two and a half years ago, so that's when we did this project recoded with the students. I started this process of doing daily sketches. And basically, every day on Instagram, I post very small sketches, really like tiny poems that I write with code. I, I write software and I post these. Um, and this is inspired by the students. At the school, we have this rules for students. These are 10 rules for students. They're um, written by Sister Corita Kent. They're popularized by John Cage. But there are these rules for students. These are awesome, by the way, that we put on the wall at the school. And rule number seven is one that I really love. It's called, uh, or it says, the only rule is work. And I just, to me, this really quite inspiring. If you work, it will lead to something. 
Um, I saw this kid on the subway, and I, I love this picture. He's holding a phone and a camera, and he's also wearing snap spectacles. So there's so many cameras happening at this moment. And then also, I'm taking a picture of him. So there's like four cameras in this moment. But I think artists need to be like this kid, like always need to be documenting and capturing everything you do. And I have this one folder on my hard drive, which is called Every Day. And every screenshot, every video, everything I make, all my sketches go in that folder. And this folder is like 300 gigabytes now. And it's driving me crazy, but it's everything is in there. Another idea that I have behind the sketching is this idea of I ABI. It's kind of inspired by this movie. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. But for me, it's ABI. And that, what that stands for is always be iterating. I think most people, when they think about creative work, you think, like, I'm going to do, I'm going to, you know, write a poem every day, or I'm going to make a drawing every day, you really think I'm going to start from scratch. Like, I'm going to start with a blank canvas. Or if I'm coding, I'm going to start with a blank piece of code. But it's actually iterating. What I try to do every day is just change, take something that I've done and change it, see how I can change it, how, how I can rework it to make something new. I think this picture really explains it quite well. So this kid had to write, I will, I will make better choices over and over again. Right? He just had to write this sentence over and over again. You could see by the end, by the bottom, he's written a single line for the L. Right? He's like this here. Like for the will, like this, he just draws a single line to draw all the Ls. That's amazing. I think that is, that is, this kid is amazing. Um, when you have to do something over and over again, you will take shortcuts. You have to take shortcuts. And those shortcuts actually become your style. As an artist, the shortcuts that you take are your style. So I started doing this sketching. I started with reflection, just thinking about how light would bounce and kind of simulating light and how, how it could bounce off of the walls. And I would show this to my daughter. She was um, six years old at the time when I started. And I, every morning, I would show her my sketches. And in the beginning, she like really loved it. She was very excited. And then like a few months in, she was like, you have to change. Like You have to add color. She, now she's like my art director, and she tells me what to do. Um, and so I, the next morning, I woke, I created a sketch which was this blobby shape, like, and thinking about blobs and like how would the, sorry, how would the blobs move and how would they animate and kind of just thinking about kind of bringing these shapes to life. Sometimes you do sketches that um, you, you know, you don't really like that much, but other people like more than you, or you like a lot and other people don't like. And I think that's quite beautiful to see sort of how your ideas are in harmony or out of harmony with the world. I did this sketch. My daughter did not like it. I liked it. Sometimes inspired by different artists or designers, like Lance Wyman, this uh, Mexico 68 logo, this is the Olympics logo. I love the way this looked. I love the kind of form. And then made this sketch, which was trying to take the blob and just say, what happens if you offset it, if you have lines that are offsetting the shape? And this, thinking about blobs, kind of interacting with blobs. Oftentimes, I'm quite excited about um, 3D forms that look like 2D or 2D forms that look like 3D. Um, I like visually ambiguous images, so images that ask your brain to work a little bit harder. So 3D, but not exactly 3D. Um, all, oftentimes, these sketches are like diaries. So after the, the election when, in 2016, I, I felt like so confused about um, the, the election and the coming new year. It was, I, was I was happy about the new year, but I was really upset about the results of the election in America. So I made this sketch, was trying to show my sort of happiness and unhappiness with the moment. Um, or after Trump was inaugurated, it we felt like we were protesting like every weekend. My wife and I were at JFK protesting. You know, it was just like we were always out on the street. So I made this sketch, which was trying to show what it felt like to be with the crowd and pushing and push, you know, kind of pushing people away. Um, this uh, sketch I made on the anniversary of my father's passing away, I was thinking about this feeling of, of being alone, and I found this motion capture data of a person walking, just this kind of single, 
you know, single person walking. Um, and to me, that, that walking sequence really captured my mood or my feeling of, of feeling alone. Sometimes they're quite random, like I'll find a video clip on my hard drive. I found this clip of like a hand painting a line. I got quite excited about it. Very graphical, um, just ta started taking circles or graphical forms. Really simple, like you take a half circle and connect it with a line. So you're only, dr only drawing kind of half circles connected with lines, but then try extruding them. Um, or s sometimes inspired by different artists. So for example, at the MoMA, I ran into this artist, Ruth Asawa. And I love her work. Um, she makes these wire sculptures that are quite beautiful in space. And then I would make a sketch that's not, I'm not trying to recreate her work, but I'm trying to get a feeling, like this feeling of having something which is kind of growing and shrinking in space, that I would you know, kind of create something in response. Um, oftentimes I do work about the body, so taking the body as a starting point and extending, extruding, or pushing the body in different directions. Um, this is taking the body and rotating in, in 3D. What happens if you take the silhouette and rotate it? Um, or attaching things to the body, attaching shapes to the body. Um, trying to really push like how far you can push to see, do you still see a person? Do you still see somebody moving? Um, this is an installation that I did at the South Bank Center. I was commissioned to create an interactive work for the launch of Margaret Atwood's new novel, Hagseed for the London Literature Festival. And for this project, we took the text of her book, so the actual words from her book, and we created uh, three scenes that you could come and perform using your body. So when you come, your you see your body, but sort of surrounded by the text, the actual language of the book. And I, I just love this kind of cr creating this playful um, experiences for people. Here's uh, Margaret Atwood. She was probably like the best at using it, actually. She was kind of amazing. Um, she told me that if Shakespeare was alive, that he would be using a connect. So that made me, that made me very <laughs> excited. Um, recently, I've been doing a lot of experiments with augmented reality. So uh, as an artist, I've been working with a AR since maybe 2002, doing projects in kind of the AR space. But last year was an interesting year where Apple and Google published these tools that allow you to do markerless AR using a phone or an iPad or some sort of device. And they, they, this happened last year at WWDC. They announced this tool. And then in the summer, I started to see all these demos that people were making. And they were really like demos. They were um, like a you know, 3D model on a tabletop. And if you saw that 3D model on its own, it wouldn't be interesting. And I was asking in, in the studio, we were really thinking about like, what does it mean to have a device in space? That you have a camera in space, that you have a microphone in space, or a speaker, or a screen in 3D, what does it mean? So we set a very simple rule, which was no external content. Only use the content that you can capture from the device, but then put it in 3D. So first experiments are quite simple, just taking photographs, and the photograph stays in the location that you took it. So when you take a photograph, it stays kind of in 3D, in the place that you took it. Um, and it creates this kind of fragmentary images uh, I was really excited about. Um, and then doing experiments like painting. So using just a slit scan, which is a common technique where you take a line of pixels. This is taking like painting with the the color that's in front of you, but painting that color in 3D in space. This is taking photographs and breaking them into pieces. So when you take a photograph, the image is kind of segmented, and then those pieces are pushed out in 3D so that they're, um, they make sense from one vantage point, but as you move, the image kind of breaks apart. This is the same thing, taking photographs and the, the picture is pushed in 3D, so there's one vantage point where the picture looks correct, but as you move, the image starts to break. This is recording frames of video, and then leaving those frames of video in 3D space where they were taken, and then you can walk through the movie and replay the movie by move, walking through it. And this is, this is not new, like there's a company called Artcom that did a project like this in 1995. But what's exciting is that we can do it now, like we have it in our phones. We can do it 
you know, with, without a ton of equipment. This is recording audio in space. And then when you move, you can replay the audio. This is a test of talking and seeing what happens when we record audio in space. This is a test of talking and what happens when we record audio in space. This is just work kind of playing with perspective. So again, putting a letter in space, but then as you move, the letter breaks. I really like AR because it, it creates, you can create very ambiguous images. So you can create you know, images that are really hard to understand. And I think the power of AR is in ambiguity, is in kind of not understanding and asking the brain to do some work. Um, more exploded peanuts. Um, doing a lot of stuff with the face, so taking the face as a starting point. Um, trying to imagine, like, if we could see the sound coming out of our mouths. Um, I would like this, actually, this is uh, John Bergerman, who's a, an amazing uh, artist and illustrator. And he, I think AR is quite a powerful medium for storytelling. So here he, he made, I built a small drawing tool. And here he draws, he's telling a story. So he draws, he says, this is the last dinosaur. And it's inside of an egg. And the egg is inside of a chicken. And the chicken is inside of a pot. And the mom is holding the pot, and she's inside of a house. And I, I just like this kind of sequence. It, it feels like AR could also be used for storytelling. Um, we've been doing a lot of experiments uh, recently with kind of face tracking and augmenting the face. Um, I recently uh, made an app uh, with my wife. It's called Weird Type. So if you want to try some of these things, there's an app now in the App Store. Um, and this app allows you to write a message and then draw with that message in space. So you can kind of, you know, write and kind of explore AR with typography and see what happens when you put messages in, in space. And what's beautiful about making an app is that people do all kinds of stuff, like things that I never expected. Somebody took the app and they were like almost created like a particle system. Like, they did stuff that I didn't even know the app could do. They were playing and kind of ex experimenting or jamming. Um, or take, like, the letter O. You can paint tunnels with the letter O. And I, I didn't know this. Like, people figured this out. And it's quite beautiful to sort of put this app out there and see all the kind of interesting things that people are doing. Um, a lot of times, they're just telling stories. Like, I really like... Um, you know, people just will, you know, use it to, you know, say, like, remain calm and, like, film around their bedroom or, like, do, you know, make cool pictures of their dog or things like that. Like, I think it's quite beautiful people using these tools to tell stories in, in ways that I never expected. Last thing I want to say is that two, two and a half years ago, I started doing this process of daily sketching, and it really changed my life. Like, it was quite, quite, um, it had a really big impact in the way that I work. And the other thing that I started doing two and a half years ago is doing open office hours. So as a student, when I was an art student, I had a printmaking teacher, and he would always like, have open office hours where he would make himself available. And I remember it was always like 3 p.m., you could go into his office, he would take a lemon poppy seed muffin and cut it into slices, and he would just listen. You could come in and talk to him about what you were working on or what you were thinking about, and he would listen and he would take you seriously. And I was an 18-year-old, and it, was, it meant a lot to me that an, an adult was taking me seriously. So I started this process of doing open office hours, where basically every week I tweet, and I say, you know, I'm having open office hours. They're usually on Fridays. And I spend two to three hours talking to people on Skype, on Hangout, in person, in New York. And I found this process to be quite amazing, like just talking to people, you know, listening, um, offering advice. Can, you know, people will have technical questions. People may have questions about studying, about portfolio. And I just try to make myself available and listen. And in a way, like um, the daily sketching is a way of saying hello to the world, kind of every day, just sort of saying hello 
And open office hours is a way of listening to the world and trying to, to be a better listener. The last thing I want to say, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, my daughter wrote this book called I Am Art. And it's her, she's much better than me at explaining um, this stuff. So I'm going to read it to you. She wanted me to tell you that she was six when she wrote this. Um, OK, the book is called I Am Art by River the Artist. This book is for Apoa, Nagana, and Nana. Art. Art is like you feel free. You feel like you can do anything. And you know what to draw. And if you don't, you look at you. You are the one. And you have your own, you have your own imagination. And maybe in your imagination, you will see lines and squares. This, this took me a long time to figure out what this, <laughs> lines and squares. And in those lines and squares, you will see art. And that art is amazing. And you are too. Ha ha, stop looking at me. Ah. Uh, Art, 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 art. I am art. Art, food is art. Art, anything is art. Art, art, art. Art, art, art. Art, art, art. Art, 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 art. Thank you. Thanks so much, Zach. And in the spirit of open office hours, we're going to open up for some questions. I have one for you really quickly, though. Um, as an artist, uh, except through your teaching, can you talk a little bit more about uh, how you work and when you're commissioned to do work? Sure. Um, I mean, the projects I do all vary. So sometimes I might be doing like a public art project or a commission. Those are you know spend, tend to spend a lot of time on, um, you know, and, and a lot of kind of you know pitching and concepting and sketching go into that kind of work. Um, and some projects I do are quite short, like really quick turnaround, like a week or two, you know, at a time. It really varies. What's your favorite type of commission? Um, I mean, increasingly, because I've been posting these sketches on Instagram, I've been getting a lot of people that basically are like, can you do that? You know, can you do that again? Yeah. You know, which I, is actually kind of amazing, because I can, I can do that again, because I already did that. Yeah. You know, and, um, and I'm finding I'm w doing that sort of work, or where somebody says, Here, you know, here's a, a prompt, like here's a photograph, or could you go to a city and, and, um, and have a creative response to it? And a lot of times sort of open-ended creative response projects are, are amazing. You know? And can you just tell everybody a little bit about what you have showing up in the um, gallery over there? Sure. So um, in the gallery, it's like, you have to go out this way and then up some stairs. Like, you kind of just keep go that way. Um, and there's, uh, I have a, um, basically four sketches running on four iPads. These are sketches from some of the sketches that I showed you today here. So that audio in space is on an iPad. There's one where you can paint with the image in front of you. There's one where you can take photographs in space. So those iPads are up and running now. And then there's a, another project called Mosque La Cara, which means uh, more than the face. And this is a public art project that we had in Houston. And it's basically a face augmentation. When it finds your face, it kind of zooms in on your face and makes a poster out of your face. So it adds a kind of graphical layer. And most face projects, like if you use Snapchat or um, you know, Facebook has some of these tools, they're really about kind of beauty and adding some kind of dog ears. But this is more graphical. It's really about kind of exploring the face and trying to come up with a very simple graphical way of showing the face. So I think we have time for three or four questions in the front row here. Hi, Zach. Amazing. Hi. I, I follow you on Twitter, and I, I see like all your messages and, and tests. It's, it's like amazing work. And, and the way you put out on the word and like for people to play is, is, is very like amazing. Uh, a question that I have, if you have investigating or are you thinking about investigating on generative art and yeah. in a sense of like, you know, that you can put data from a source and interacting with your stuff. Mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, I, yeah, sometimes I do work that involves data. So taking, you know, taking, um, taking data as a, as a source for the work that I do. A lot of the sketches that I do have no sort of data. They're not really driven by data, but they're driven by math and really trying to find the kind of beauty in math. And it's quite, it's not a far step to connect them to data sources. And so sometimes for my commercial work, I might get a client that has a data source that they want me to visualize, or sometimes for projects. Um, 
a lot of the work that I do that's interactive uses the body as a data source. So really kind of taking like your movement, your contours, you know, your face, your facial expression as a starting point and, and use that as, as input. But I, it's not far to think about kind of generative work using data. Anybody else? So you've been working with young people uh, so long, as well as uh, engaging with your daughter, as well as opening these office hours to engage with people from all over the world. Um, in all that time that you've been doing that, have you seen how people's, and especially young people's perceptions have changed around creative coding? And could you speak to that, how they have evolved? And where do you see the future is at as taken by this new generation yeah. in terms of what they're concerned with right now? Yeah, I mean, definitely when I started, um, I got it, when I got into graduate school, it was really sort of the end of one era, which was sort of CD-ROM, you know, you needed a SGI, a really expensive computer to make this kind of artwork. And it, it was really like a change of, things being you know, much more accessible, like when you had laptops, when you could make artwork using laptops. We used to travel around, Golan and I were at Sonar, Sonorama in, I don't know, 10 years ago, and we had like big Dell, big huge computers, and now it's quite, things are getting smaller. And I, at that time, you really had to fight to say that coding should be at an art school, that you really had to kind of push to say that at, at an art school, we should be looking at computers as, as tools for, Creativity, not just like Photoshop or Illustrator, but really like making software and using software as an artistic medium. And I think that that we don't have to have those fights anymore. Like I'm, I think that that that's way more understood, and that's changing. Younger people are more um, in tune with that. And I think what we need always are better better tools and better um, you know platforms for people to create with. So. I'm quite excited to see what people are doing with, you know, tools that, you know, you don't have to you don't have to write code like in C++ or, you know, some sort of older languages. People are doing really interesting things with JavaScript. People are doing beautiful things with, you know, graph touch design or graphical programming and and also machine learning using like training the computers on data sets for creative purposes like that. I'm excited to see what tools will come out, you know, to help this next generation express themselves. In the front here. So when you said tools, any immersive media technology space tools and any new avenues in there? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm quite excited about a AR, so I'm obviously building tools in that space and I'm excited f to see how people will use it to express themselves. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think there's a lot of interesting things out there for, for people. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, you've been creating cool stuff for so long. Uh, any trick for when you are down on your creative juices? And yeah. how do you step up your game or recycle yourself after? So yeah, much? I have, so there's a couple of tricks. One is I have a folder called Inspiration, where I basically have like images or screenshots or things of stuff that I just love that I find I'm like, okay, I could, I could like meditate on this sketch. An archive. An archive in a way, like, but of inspiration, of really like to say, I, if I don't know what to make, I can kind of go to that. And then the best thing is always to go to something that you've done, like go back to what you've done and don't be afraid to repeat yourself. And really like you're creating for you, like you're putting it out there, other people can enjoy it, but you're really creating for yourself. And so you should feel free to say like, I'm gonna just do the same thing over and over again. Like a drummer would have some like routine that they're just like, do it and do it and do it, you know? And I think it, you know, to kind of go back again and again at the same thing and say, how can I change it? How can I, how I move it? You know, then uh, that's, th that's easy. The other thing is I try to have a rule, which is like, you have, if you're gonna do any sort of daily project, you have to have, a way to do it in five minutes. You, have to, you could spend an hour, sometimes I'll spend, you know, hours on a sketch, but so, sometimes I'll spend five minutes. Yeah, it has to be something that you can do in five minutes, because there will be days when f you only have five minutes, or you only want to give five minutes to it, and kind of making it small and simple really helps. We have time for one more. So speaking to the AR that you've been working yeah. with, it's 
very kind of inspiring and different from what I've seen other people do as examples. Do you feel like there's a lot more to explore there, or is the technology kind of limiting you? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a ton more to explore. I'm quite excited about, um, like, right now there's a bit of an arms race. Like, these companies are kind of like one-upping each other and saying, like, we have this other new feature, a new feature. And, but I'm quite excited about things like persistence, the idea that you could do stuff in space, but it would stay there. And that, that creates all kinds of new sort of storytelling techniques or new things that you could do. Right now, AR is quite dumb. Like when you quit the app, when you start the app, it always just like the center of the world is where you start the app. But multi-person experiences, uh, persistence, also things like occlusion or understanding more about geometry will allow us to do more interesting things. So I think I, I'm excited because we're these companies are sort of in a weird arms race to sol solve a lot of these problems. And I think there's a, it's really important for artists to be there. Like, you know, these companies like Google, Facebook, uh, Snap, Apple, like they, they want to tell the story about what these technologies are, but artists should be there and have a, have a role to be there to actually shape what these technologies could be and how they should, you know, be, be used. Thank you so much, Zach, and I encourage you all to go and see some of his experiments up there. Yeah. Thank you.